Hello, and welcome to Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Uh, again, uh, number, I think, four. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm I'm your host, Jay-Z, and uh, it is just me today. Uh, all, all of you guys, gals, bin- non-binary pals, whatever. Uh, the tiger lady who fed her husband to the tiger's chickadees or something like that. Sorry, this is uh, a lot of technical difficulties on this one. Um, trying out some new things, and this is attempt number six. Uh, it's It has been fraught with technical difficulties, to say the least. Um, so, just me today, which means no guest. Apologies for that. I would love to have guests on every single time. In fact, I'd love to have a podcast every single week instead of uh, every other week, or bi-weekly, or whatever argument you want to make for that. Um, but I can't because for, well, for several reasons, uh, one first reason is uh, I'm kind of a nobody. Most people don't actually know where, who I am and what I'm doing. And, uh, almost, almost every single podcast request that I put out there is, Hey, sorry, this is completely out of the blue. I'm just this random guy from the internet. Um, I like snakes. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, the other reason is it is very difficult even for people who do say, let's do this. This actually sounds like fun to w- to be able to coordinate and schedule, even though we're doing it almost all remotely at this point. Um, but that's okay. Um, I have a few still in the bank, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. But uh, the other reason was that I wanted to do every once in a while some of these that are a little bit more of a longer in-depth update uh, to talk about things going on here, Jay-Z's reptile side of things going on with me uh, and my animals and my crew of uh, people who help me manage my giant chaotic mess. Um, And so that being said, tonight, uh, as I said earlier, fraught with technical difficulties, Uh, I was given some really cool new audio equipment for this podcast specifically. Got a really nice uh, podcasting microphone, a really good pop filter, a really uh, the swing arm to use as a mount for a mic that's hanging right now. Um, The problem with that is number one, uh, this room that I have, and if you guys are watching the video, sorry, audio only. Uh, listeners, uh, the background is a little bit different than anything that you've seen before, uh, and that is because I have set up a podcast room. Uh, in reality, uh, that is a room that we have our dogs in. Um, a couple of them uh, can just kind of hang out during the day while we're not home, but several do need to be kenneled up in uh, in their crates for various reasons of will get into the trash, are incontinent, things like that. Um, or sometimes they just like to be jerks and mischievous and tear stuff up like a blanket for no reason. But that being said, uh, so with the chance of solo podcasting like today, I can sit there and try to mess with the microphone and things like that. Um, the microphone has been a bit of an issue for this one. Number one, uh, attaching it to the arm of the little, the little swing arm. I don't have a good place to hang it up in here. There's... The reason why I chose in here is because uh, there aren't a whole lot of rooms where it can be quiet for an hour plus uh, in the house. And even then it was difficult. Like the, our pet rats are in this room too. And I had to just take their water away because it gets so loud. The microphone picks it up. Um, But the microphone has been having issues because I have to use an attachment to attach the USB microphone to my iPhone, which I'm recording on, um, because the webcam that I use is not nearly as high quality as even the front-facing cam of the new iPhone. So using that, uh, there were some issues with connectivity, and I thought I finally figured it out after the fourth, no, the fifth attempt, and we recorded, the, and I recorded the whole podcast almost a full hour long, and about 40 minutes into it, the static just built up. I... I must have tapped it or moved it or a cable got loose somehow. And the audio for not only that latter half was messed up, there was a little sound bite. Five minutes in, there was a sound hiccup. 
eight minutes in and then another one at around 15. So I just said, screw it. We'll just do it over again. So apologies if I sound a little redundant, uh, not necessarily as high energy, not even as high energy, but in this way, I may actually not repeat myself as much as I usually do, because that's what I am very, very good at is repeating myself, but that's okay. So, um, I talked a little bit about this a second ago, this background here. So if I'm going to make this a podcast room, I figured let's, you know, kind of do it right a little bit. And I may have stolen this a little bit from a couple other podcasters, um, more specifically, and I'll totally own up to it, uh, from the ground up podcast. Uh, Joe's, uh, he is known for his, uh, corn snake breeding as well as, uh, kind of a start in Morelia, although he, I don't, I don't even know if he has his carpet or green tree anymore, actually. I know he has some liasses, which is really cool. Um, but I don't know if he actually has Morelia anymore, but that being said, um, he also has a really good reptile podcast. Um, really great guy. Not only, uh, his podcast and reptile breeding, just a good person in general, uh, and you guys should totally go check him out. Shameless plug for all of you listeners out there. The few of you at this moment. Appreciate it. Um, he has this background, if you watch the YouTube uh, version of this, that it looks, I think it looks like a shower curtain or something. But he has a bunch of reptile stickers and things. Sorry, just going to reach over here. Ah, sorry about that. Door didn't quite shut and the cat was trying to sneak in. Hopefully we don't have any more cat interruptions, but we'll see. Now that... I've alerted him to my presence, other than just me talking, he may have really tried again, too. And he can unlock the... He can open shut doors, too. So, hooray, my animals are great. Uh, but, um, and we'll get to that one in just a second, too. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of reptile stickers, or I didn't want to just straight up take his thing. Um, even though I would like to put my stickers somewhere, and I don't really want to put them on an incubator or a rack or something. So what I thought I would do is, because I do like these kind of uh, fake wood walls, um, I actually have a couple up in the house as well, just in, in the regular house, although it's actually actual wood. Um, this stuff is just kind of big board that I uh, nailed gunned up. But uh, instead of stickers, I thought it'd be really cool, which... Being a little optimistic here that eventually if I were to get popular enough where people send in like fan art and stuff, um, and I do have a couple pieces and I'll move the, and if you can take a look, there's up there, we rehomed a couple rats that we had that were just too nice to be feeders, um, including a little boy who only had three legs that I don't know how that got missed, um, and a little stubby tail and a family took that took him and they wanted friends and these two other ones seemed to get along really well with the little tripod ratto and they took all three and they made that cute little thing and even though it's folded open there's like a little drawing of cheese and stuff um and there's also a really cool painting right there um that was done for me for christmas because it looks nice and cute of a snake on a tree and then on the other side over here once again sorry audio only listeners um, are the Certificates of Bravery from Colorado Gators. There we go. We'll just adjust it a little bit. Um, you know, try to stay up on this because I have to hold the mic. Um, my taxidermy elk, because that's the only taxidermy, uh, mammal that I'll probably ever have that isn't like a skeleton or something. Um, and that really nice picture from DFW Reptarium, which, um, actually it's been almost a year now, uh, since it was like mid-February, uh, 2020, when we very first really got going on this channel, and we went down to Texas to the NARBC show, and to see a couple people down there, and DFW Reptarium is an amazing reptile store, um, and this will probably be one of my last plugs, hopefully, um, but that being said, they have an amazing section, great people, and they have, a, a they took all of this art from this, uh, photographer that this, uh, that this guy had, and are selling it in their store, and they have a really great store behind it, and I encourage you to go watch the video that I uh, did, because I explained a little bit more about that, uh, as well as what, uh, check them out on Facebook and Instagram and all that jazz, and give them some love, because they deserve it. Um, but those certificates of bravery right there, um, those come from the Colorado Gator Park. Um, here in Colorado, it's kind of famous, although for some reason, people still don't know about it, even though... Um, it's been since the early 90s, since they've had alligators. The Tawapi Farm's been running since the 70s. Um, and they've been famous for alligators since the 90s, for sure. Um, 
but you can go down there and you can see them. But every time you go in, you hold, they hold, uh, bleh, they make you hold a baby alligator. Um, and that's also part of their way of their kind of head count. Um, and then you take a picture, um, with your phone, with their camera, and then like, they have the little alligator that you hold kind of chomp down on the paper. And then that's your certificate of bravery. Good job. You held this amazing prehistoric animal. Um, which honestly is really cool. Not a whole lot of people get to hold an alligator, period. Not everyone is uh, jaded like me or some of the other people in the hobby that uh, get to play with big ones, too. So, that being said, um, you should absolutely go check them out. Did a video with them. Um, and even though I am there, you know, sometimes close to ten times a year, they still make me do that every single time. So, they just start to pile up sometimes. Um, so I just grabbed a couple that were loose in the room when I tidied it up to start doing this and tacked them to the wall. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, more popular, uh, I get, maybe I can get some more fan art or cool pictures or something like that. Nothing too big, because I don't have unlimited space, and it'd be cool to show off a bunch of little things. But, um, fingers crossed I can add to that as this continues, and I can figure out a better setup with, have this microphone stop being an issue. Um, but, that being said, uh, obligatory podcast drink. Um, once again, sorry, audio only fans, uh, as anyone who has met me in real life, I am a very vocal teetotaler. So no, uh, no, no white claw for me this evening. Although this is actually now two o'clock in the morning. So not exactly evening, but, uh, Mountain Dew code red for me. But I think that concludes the regular kind of podcasty type update video or updates I have for you guys. Um, now let's actually talk about reptiles because, you know, it's a reptile podcast or really animal podcast because I think it'd be really cool to get some more guests onto here that, um, oh, actually, before we get to reptiles, talk about this really quick. Um, it'd be really cool to get more guests on this podcast that do more than just reptiles, like people who work in animal conservation, period, or who work uh, in other aspects of, you know, wildlife or the natural world. Um, and that includes actually next week's guest. Um, we did a pre-recording with her back in, um, the end of October for the flying foxes that we did for the Halloween spectacular series. Um, each week we did a different animal associated with Halloween. Actually not each week, it was twice a week. So, uh, every video for all of October was the different Halloween spooky animals. So it was the spooktacular. Um, and she, uh, recently moved back to Australia to get her, uh, master's degree and no, not master's or doctorate, uh, at the university of Newcastle in, uh, Australia. At least I think it was Newcastle. It's been a while since I listened to it. Um, forgive me, Cassandra, if I messed that up, uh, they'll be clarified on the video. Um, but while she was there to do the top podcast about the flying foxes, where we were at, where she's recording, and you can still hear the flying foxes above her head, because she's just standing in the reserve while we're recording. We recorded almost a full hour podcast after that video, uh, and it's finally going to come out. But that being said, uh, the audio quality is not really what I would like, and I do apologize for that in advance. Um, as I mentioned before, I have stockpiled a few and I will probably continue to do so when I am able to, uh, because it is, as I said before, it is difficult to get a hold of people. And as much as I am fully capable of just rattling on for, you know, an hour or so on my own, probably every week for the next few months, I would think that'd be pretty boring for you guys. Eventually my stories would probably get a little bit old, um, and it's kind of the same thing that everybody hears stuff like, oh, a snake got out, oh, I finally find him, or things like that. Um, but uh, I do apologize about the audio quality. That's why we got the microphone and all of the other stuff, where hopefully moving forward after this bank of them, uh, it will be better. That being said, we do use Zoom, um, and I'm trying to mess with Google Hangouts, and if there's anyone out there who does podcasting that records better audio portions of those, uh, please let me know what you use so it can be better for the audio format. Uh, as far as video goes, um, I can't record unless I pay for Zoom on my iPhone. It's just easier on the laptop. That means that the uh, webcam that I have is not as great, so... The video, the video will not be as high quality as the iPhone stuff that I normally shoot because, you know, it's a 4K phone. Um, 
4K camera on the iPhone, whatever. Um, but uh, the audio hopefully will be better moving forward after a few of these that are banked up. Um, and like I said, this next week, I think it's really interesting. It doesn't necessarily have to do with reptiles. It has to do with more biology and wildlife management and how people and biologists and scientists have to bring across and think about how people are affected or how to bring this to people when it comes to, uh, comes to the natural world outside of the, you know, the scientific community, because, um, kind of like engineering where you can design something perfectly and test it so much, but if it, as soon as it gets into the hands of someone, they mess it up, it means you messed up. Uh, and so it's kind of like that people have a tendency to just kind of muddle things around. So they have to think about the best way they can bring their information to be palatable for, you know, the, you know, outside of the scientific community as a whole. And, uh, it's a lot more interesting and in depth than I honestly gave much thought to. So it was a really interesting podcast for me. I learned a whole lot and hopefully you do too. Uh, and again, I apologize for the sound quality. So back to reptiles. Um, so if any of you have followed me on Facebook or on Instagram, then, uh, cause I haven't done a whole video about this cause honestly, I'm really bad about posting on social media and stuff. Um, but our green, uh, gw <laughs> drink are very large, um, although they do get bigger, large red iguana female queenie, uh, laid some infertile eggs or possibly infertile eggs. We didn't really know. Um, so it's a possibility and it does happen fairly often. So, um, what she is, so for any of you people out there, I'm going to do a quick, quick little paraphrase as best as I can. Um, a green, so she's a red iguana, but her species actually is a green iguana. She is a green iguana. That is the species name, kind of like boa constrictor. And there are a few uh, color phases out there too, just like boa constrictors. Um, there's the greens, there's reds, there's blue, which is the azanthic. It's a recessive trait. Um, there's albino, there's hypo. Um, Tom Crutchfield has his line of crimson albino. And I'm not sure if that is a hypo albino or just um, a really, really high red, really pretty line of albino. I'm not hundred percent sure, but, um, iguanas are a species. And this is how you know that reptiles are pretty closely related to birds. Sometimes they will just kind of cycle themselves and produce follicles, build eggs, and then lay eggs on their own. Um, a number of species can do it, including lizards and snakes. I don't know if any turtles or crocodilians can, but I do know a number of lizards and snakes can, um, as well as parthenogenesis, which is a phenomenon that happens when a female animal will produce viable embryos and reproduce what is essentially little clones of themselves. And that isn't always the case. Um, but uh, I'll talk to that in just a second. Um, they they think that this occurs as a result of uh, a you know kind of natural occurrence or uh, what what I should say is they think that this happens. Scientists believe this happens because it's a result of there being only one. There's no males in the area that they are, and so a female will just essentially reproduce a small clone of herself because, you know, they need that other chromosome from the male to create, you know, differentiate, differentiating offspring. So essentially she just reproduces that single double XX chromosomes and produces little clones of herself and hope that her offspring are able to continue the gene pool and find males elsewhere. Um, at least that is one theory. That being said, there are some exceptions. Um, number one, um, there are some, or at least thought to be only, or very much so, uh, exclusively parthenogenic, uh, species like morning geckos. They're thought to be an entirely parthenogenic species, all female. And there's, uh, several different species of whiptails and some other ones out there that are theoretically almost all or all parthenogenic, all female, no males. They all just reproduce on their own. Um, and I read an article a couple years ago 
that I don't quite remember. I, it was either a water moccasin. I want to say it was a water moccasin, but it might have been a copperhead that did reproduce a parthenogenic um, litter because they're vipers and they have live babies. Uh, a, I really hope I just said that right. I'm 99% sure that is correct, and I feel really dumb. I'm brain farting you guys. I'm really sorry. Um, but there were male offspring in that litter. And I can't remember which species it was. It was one of those two I know. And and I don't remember if they were all male or it was actually a mix. So I don't know. Nature's crazy, you guys. Uh, Ian Malcolm was right. Nature finds a way. Um, but that being said, there, as far as I am aware, and several other people I reached out to, including Tom Crutchfield, and if you're messing with iguanas, he's a good person to reach out to. Um, no one has ever produced viable parthenogenic red or green iguana eggs. Ever, 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 ever. But this is not the first time that Queenie has done this. This is actually the third season in a row where I don't know what I'm doing. Um, because they're not outside at all. They're in a very large aviary. Um, but I don't know what I'm doing, but this is the third year that she's laid eggs. Um, and I'm just happy that she cleared them all and she's healthy and she's putting on weight again. Um, because that can be a big issue with females who self cycle like that and lay what are normally, uh, slug or infertile eggs. Um, Last year, she had a larger clutch, uh, and not as many seemed viable, but they did go, some of them almost went a month in the incubator, and a lot of them started to develop kind of those blood veins, but that's where they stopped. They never went full term. Uh, this last time, it was about 38-ish decent-looking eggs, um, and about another eight or so that definitely were slugs. And then after a couple of days, that whittled down to about 20 or so. And then after about a week, they had all stopped. And so they, she slugged out. They were all infertile. Um, but she's happy. She's at, well, she's not happy. She's kind of a jerk to begin with. So most iguanas are, by the way. Um, and as has been her, uh, how, how it's been for the past two years, as well as this time, she is a complete jerk for about a month afterwards. And so she's just now not tail whipping me when I open up the door to mess with them anymore. Um, still doesn't really like me too much. Um, she never really does. Um, she'll hang out on my shoulders or on my head if I really try, like, am working with her, but she doesn't really like the interaction. Azuli, the blue that lives in there, she does like the attention or at least I assume she does. Uh, she certainly likes to go out and adventure, so she will uh, jump up onto my leg and crawl up onto my shoulders and hang out until she gets bored and then inevitably tries to uh, fl uh, Superman leap off of me. But um, that being said, we are happy that she's healthy, she's recovered, and she passed all the eggs because, as I said before, it can be a huge issue for females. I'd mentioned in one of my other, like, vloggy videos, um, which is why I don't really like, I don't like doing the vloggy videos that much. I know a lot of other people do, um, more vloggy videos and understand why that can happen after a while. You kind of start to run out of informational content without repeating yourself too often, and so that's where you usually end up at, but I'm not a big fan of it. I don't really feel super, super comfortable doing it right about that. Um, and I'm trying to stay super limited on what I'm discussing on here too, just cause I don't really feel comfortable doing it as much. This whole social media thing is really, uh, really alien for me. And I'm quite a troglodyte when it comes to it. And I'm really showing my age, uh, when I say things like that, where I'll say Facebook forums and things like that, uh, to where honestly, this is quite the foreign landscape for me. And if it wasn't for the fact that I know this is the best way to reach people, I probably wouldn't be on here much at all. I probably wouldn't even have a Facebook. Um, but I digress. Uh, in one of the videos that I put out, you know, I had two female corn snakes, never in with a male, housed separately in the entire time um, that I've had them. Um, in a rack system, huge tubs, the 74 quart tubs. Um, but they both self-cycled this last year and, uh, Omega, the, uh, Okatee corn snake that I have a really long time, um, they both egg bound and she did not make it. Unfortunately, I did not catch it in time. Um, and she just didn't fully recover. And then Sierra, the Annery one, 
um, we did, uh, she did make it through. Um, still a little skinny, uh, but she's pounding smaller mice now. I want to get her weight back on. Um, so she's eating a little bit more frequently than I normally would for an adult corn snake that I'm not breeding or, or, uh, brewmating, but she's doing a lot better. And she's actually even featured in a video that's coming out soon. Um, but, uh, as I said, it, it can be dangerous for them. So I'm just glad the queenie's okay. And it's a little, it's a little disheartening or a bit of a bummer to, that we didn't get them again this year, but it's okay because to be completely honest with you, her being okay is more important as well as I don't even know what I would do if I ended up with half a dozen baby iguanas because as I mentioned, iguanas aren't great pets and while there, I'm sure there's a number of reptile people out there that would be interested in taking one because it is such, it would be a phenomenon, excuse me, um, that it happened in the first place and so they'd want to get one of those and see if it continued to do so, but I'm not super comfortable with that, to be completely honest with you, although it would be interesting, but I just, I really wouldn't want to deal with a bunch of baby iguanas running around. Um, so while we're on the subject of babies, um, we'll talk about uh, the breeding plans a little bit. Um, so I did, I really have to stop saying, um, I used to be a lot better about that. Apologies. Uh, but, um, anyone who gets that reference, uh, I did a video about the breeding plans, and I don't exactly uh, know why someone made a comment that I'm a scammer to take a look at my snakes on that video. I I don't, I don't know. YouTube comments are weird, um, and I have a hard time not getting bummed out by the negative ones or the thumbs down. Um, but that being said, I talked about a lot about the ball python pairings that I'm doing, and I entirely spaced talking about the boas that we're breeding this year. Um, number one, because I get distracted doing that. And number two, I, I don't know if it's great for me to do too, too many, like 20 to 30 minute videos outside of a podcast forum. And I just completely spaced it. I was really concentrating on the ball pythons. So I do have two pairs of boas going this year, which is super exciting for me. Um, if you guys watched the first video, I talk about how I really wanted to do boa constrictors. That's where, yeah, it wasn't my first snake, but that's where I truly fell in love with snakes in general. Um, absolutely love them. Don't get me wrong, I still love all the other ones. I'm a generalist for sure. If you guys haven't been able to tell from all of the different snake species that appear in all of the videos, which almost all of them are my own. Um, so if we're talking about like the top five list that people seem to like for some reason. Um, but first you're actually breeding boas after all the setbacks. And um, I really do slow grow the boas. Um, like I, I, I really do. Like I know a lot of people can get them to breed after four or five years. Mine are sitting around five, six, and even one of them um, seven when she will be going. Because I just, I'm honestly more concerned with their overall health than breeding constantly and turning a high profit. Um, that's how you know I'm a really great breeder. Like, they won't be going every year. They're going to be skipping years. I even skip seasons on the ball pythons, too. Um, one of them has gone two years without breeding uh, this last time. and But I digress. Um, so finally getting one, and I have a couple more that will be ready for this coming winter season. Um, and that is Upsilon, who is just our normal call albino female. So that's just the single visual gene albino. And then we paired her to Church, who is our super ghost uh, from Twisted Genetics. Um, yeah, Twisted Genetics. Sorry, I have a few that are from his lineage. Like, his animals produce babies, and he sold them. Someone got them, grew them up, bred them, and I have those babies. So they're, like, second cousins to Church that I have. Um, so it's kind of the same original line, but have diverged a little bit. Um, but so the super ghost boa. So if any of you aren't super familiar with boa morphs, so ghost is a two gene animal. So there's hypo, which is hypomelanistic, the reduction of melanin. In boas, it's a incomplete dominant, kind of like in ball pythons, pastel or mojave. And so the homozygous form is an even lighter animal, kind of like the super pastel um, and then the recessive aneurtheristic or anery makes that black and white looking animal or black and gray looking animal. So in the ghost, it's those two showing. And then the super ghost 
it's the homozygous form. So he is a super ghost. So hypo, super hypo, anery. Het albino. So he's actually het moonglow. Moonglow in boas is where you hit all three, um, at least in the call line. In the sharp line, it's snow glow. But I don't have any sharp animals, so that's neither here nor there. So hopefully with this, we will be able to produce albino babies. So theoretically, if you go with the odds of the Punnett square or whatever it may have you, um, as looking at a whole litter, not the individual animal, half the babies will be albino because one parent, because Upsilon is the visual, every single baby will be a, a hypo because uh, Church is a super. So every baby will be a hypo. Hooray, no normals. And then half of those will be albino. So theoretically, if we get a litter of 30, which would be really good for her first litter, it'll probably be more like in the high single digits or teens, um, fingers crossed. Uh, every single baby will be hypo. So it'll be half hypos, half sunglows, and they will all be het anery. So we will get some albino head anaries and some sunglow head moonglows, which will be really, really cool. Um, and I am super looking forward to that. Um, then that being said, we also have another boa breeding going and they are not imperators. They are the Dumerals boas. So if any of you saw the video and I will keep probably mentioning my own stuff just because that's where it's the most relatable. And I assume you found this podcast off of those videos. Um, Seriously, I really have to stop saying, um, I got a lot better about that. I really apologize. But I got them back. I had them for a number of years and then times hit hard, rehomed them, got them back recently because of COVID. The person who had them couldn't take care of them. Life happens. They He took a great, great care of them. But they are proving to be just as stubborn in breeding as they were eight years ago now. Or, you know, seven years ago, seven years ago. Um lot of, you know, a lot of snuggling, a lot of lock, not a lot, but locking. Thought I saw an ovulation on Lily. Um, sorry, name's James Lily. Gotta love Harry Potter, although I guess we hate J.K. Rowling now, um, which honestly I'm okay with. Uh, but, you know, they, they it seems like, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I know people who accidentally breed successfully breed their Doomerals boas. I know two people who did it last year. Um, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, and the person who had them for a couple years also witnessed the same would courtship and breeding, but never anything. And they're doing it again now. Um, I've seen two locks on them, no ovulation, but you know, fingers crossed to be really cool to get some Doomerals babies. Um, I did pick up another male Doomrolls, uh, a younger male. So if James is the problem, because he is kind of a weird wonky boy, um, maybe if he's the issue, well, I have some new, a new, a new viral, or a new uh, aspiring male, because I'm just going to keep fumbling that word. I apologize. Uh, and maybe we can get some Doomrolls bows there, because they are really coming into vogue right now. Um, and I think it's for a number of reasons. The first one is... Uh, Madagascar isn't exporting them anymore, but they haven't for a little while, I think. Um, so really what we have is what we have to work with. It's kind of like bearded dragons to where Australia does not export, period. So whatever Australian animals we have, we have, that's it. And we, those were all acquired through, uh, mysterious means. Like they just happened to, uh, come out of this pipe that, uh, came from Australia to Germany and then we got, or... They happen to be in someone's pants. I don't know how that happened. Um, although with Doomerals Boas, I don't think it's quite as uh, risque as all of that. But I could be wrong. Um, there's a lot of history behind the Hope to Culture uh, community and hobby that is a little shady. Um, and I hope to eventually talk to one of the older school guys that was really into ball pythons. Because that... That is that is a mess right there. A lot of stuff happened. with Like, people died with ball pythons, um, when that whole craze was going on. It's insane. Um, but that being said, uh, I think it may have something to do with that to where now like Madagascar is like, nope, no more, none for you. Um, already the Maddie ground boas weren't able to go and now doom rolls aren't either. Um, so I think maybe that's why they're really picking up in price as well as, um, and I might get a little bit of hate from this because no matter whenever you bring up his name, um, Brian Barcheck, 
he has a huge influence in the hobby. Um, and honestly, I think for the best, and hear me out for all of you Brian haters out there, um, not saying that I am or not, but he does have a huge influence on there. He's one of the largest breeders in the States for a long time. And with his online presence, he has a huge pull of people into the hobby. It's how he got me for, honestly, like I was always interested and I had a couple leopard geckos, but watching his videos made me more interested, especially with the ball pythons and things like that, obviously. Um, but he does have a whole lot of presence and personality. And, and so, you know, even with the things that he was doing that even now, even he has admitted that it's not great or what he was doing was the best for things. Um, he, you know, so because of that and anyone who went, no, that's messed up. I'm going to do it the right way. So you get a way over correction of things that he was doing for better keeping. So maybe overall net positive. I don't really know. Um, I'm not going to mess with spider ball Python. I'm not going to get into the whole spider ball Python thing. Um, but that being said, a while ago, he got super into the Mexican black king snakes and really pushed them on his YouTube presence and really pushed them on his websites and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, this $50, $60 snake is going for two, $300. And I don't know if he's 100% responsible for that, but it certainly seemed like that happened. And while I know there was kind of a huge influx of Asia importing a lot of our animals, mostly colubrids like um, the king snakes and the bull snakes and things like that. I feel like he did have a pretty big uh, influence in that. And I know both he and uh, more Kevin McCurley from Nerd um, did a lot about doom rolls boas. Uh, uh, like, uh, like they really focused on there. And then almost it seemed like the next week where I was seeing doom rolls boas for two, three hundred dollars for single animals. Now they're at five and six hundred dollars and thousand dollars for a pair like it was almost overnight it felt like and it was right when they were really pushing uh or promoting i should say promoting doom rolls bows on their youtube channel so i'm wondering if that does have something to do with it because it is remarkable the amount of power and swing that youtube or influencers of whatever platform or hobby or community have over people i mean jordan's right? Air Jordans or whatever product that a sports star or a uh, celebrity is pushing that has over people that gets very popular. So maybe there's something to do with that. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's that. Sorry for this little uh, tangent about that, but it's something that I always kind of think about. Um, and that, yeah, most people will say, obviously the exportation thing, but when I mention the, the swing about that, they usually go, oh yeah, that's, that's a really good point. That's possible. Um, so sorry about that. Um, that being said, uh, I didn't mention too, too much in the video I did about breeding, uh, snakes. We do have a few girls that, uh, will be coming up soon. Um, so for this coming breeding season, if you didn't catch the video, uh, I don't do a whole lot of crazy combos. I do mostly stuff that I think looks a little bit different or interesting. So with a lot of other snakes, when it comes to breeding, they do more line breeding or polymorphic breeding where they sp pick specific traits that they like and they breed for that. Um, so, you know, when you get an animal that's very, very pink, you breed it to another very pink animal to get the pinkest possible animals. And with ball pythons, that isn't really done a whole lot. Um, Ozzy Boyd being the exception. Oh, Ozzy Boyd. I want to say it's Ozzy Boyd. I can keep saying Boyd. Um, sorry if it's not. I apologize. Um, you can totally call me out. Um, he is definitely the exception where his line of orange dream, um, as well as this high intensity orange dream gene, I think that's different than his line or something, uh, where they are just incredibly bright orange and it's different. Uh, that being said, uh, most ball pythons and including some of those too, they, they dull out after a while where they look very bright and vibrant when they're born and until they're around like five, 600 grams, like right when they're like, okay, cool, let's start making more of these with this animal, then they really dull out and they don't look as nice. Don't get me wrong, they still look very pretty, but they don't hold the same color. Like the pastels are born bright neon yellow, and then most turn kind of a brown greenish kind of with hues. So what I want to do 
And supposedly this is being done in Europe a little bit more because honestly, they kind of, we emulate a lot of what they do over there. They do stuff and then we end up kind of picking that up later. Um, although we definitely went hard and heavy with kind of industrialized breeding here because that's what we do. Um, but I would like to breed more higher quality individual single double gene morphs that just are really good representations or really weird ones of their genes and continue those lines to make really nice, even just normals to really nice pastels that hold color into the thousand plus grams into adulthood. They're still pretty yellow, kind of like carpet pythons that now they're like highlighter yellow and jet black instead of kind of the more muddy looking uh, jungle carpets and things like that. I want to do something like that with ball pythons. Um, and so I am trying to do that. So, you know, for the orange dream, as I said before, excluding the high, the, like the extreme or uh, high intensity or Aussie's line, they kind of brown out after a while. And so I have a couple animals that are just single gene orange dreams, but you can tell that they're a little bit more orange. Um, they'll usually brown to like kind of like a pale tan or like an orangey brown. And I have one that's really light. And I have another one that is kind of like halfway up its sides there you can see that there's still some orange leaking through and it's holding on to that color better so i'm breeding those to get more orange animals and that did come through when they're babies where i got one super one really nice orange dream and then two okay-ish looking orange dreams like normal orange dreams and so we held on to the super uh because it was a she's a really nice looking even super for that matter and then we sold uh, the orange to some, the really nice looking orange one to someone who is also working on the orange dream things. So I'm hoping to do that as well as bringing that into the calico, um, and a whole lot of other things like that. And I've talked a little bit about my weird pastel who doesn't look like she's a full pastel. She almost looks like a messed up bumblebee, but there's no spider in her whatsoever. But I don't know. That's a story for another day. And I'll do a whole section about a podcast about her because it's, it's really weird, and it stumps a lot of other ball python specific breed. Well, not specific, but like bigger breeders and been doing it longer and more successfully than me. Um, all around the place, no one knows what's going on with her. But that being said, um, I'm trying to breed more of those than more than just like doubling up and getting a whole bunch of high combos. Although I am still trying to do some things like that. I'm mostly working on things that I would like to do, continuing like new lines of my own or just better quality looking individual genes, as well as just more that I like to begin with. So I don't do a whole, whole lot of recessive traits. I work with, actually, I guess now that I think about it, I do have a few. I do have a couple clowns going, but nothing crazy yet. Uh, I have a few girls that hopefully will be coming up in this coming season. Um, but right now, just some pastel clowns, killer clowns, and some banana clowns are hopefully what we get this year. Um, a few girls that need to be proven out as het, hopefully, fingers crossed. <clears throat> as well as some pides that we have going. The pinstripe pied hopefully will go. As well as I uh, saw a lock finally after three years of our Mystic Potion who's possible het pied uh, with our pied male Seattle, who is a successful daddy uh, who bred our uh, banana het clown or het pied last year um and he proved out and we got banana pied and so hopefully this year we can get mystic and mojave pieds which look really cool um and if they don't go we did pick up a mojave banana uh that is clear for quarantine that i need to be taking out of here soon um because that's uh, another update for you guys as soon as i finish this little section uh that he will be put to her to hopefully make banana mystic potions. Although that asshole could just make a leucistic uh, because of how supers work with Mojave. So she's the mystic potion. That's the uh, allelic super. And so every baby that she produces will be either a mystic or a Mojave. And so if I put a banana Mojave to her, I could get banana Mo mystic potions with the Mojave and the mystic. But I could also get super Mojaves, regular mystic potions, and banana of all of those. Um, which the banana will show through the mystic potion, not so much on the, on the bell, but that's okay. Um, maybe it'll look kind of interesting because like the super Mojaves, they get that kind of like brown head stamp, uh, and maybe that would lighten up or look kind of different with the banana in there. I don't really know. 
Uh, that being said, um, hopefully I have uh, some really cool ones coming up soon. Um, this 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 current breeding, it's mostly the single um, two gene. Uh, I'm really sorry, little burpee, bleh, uh, clowns as well as those two kind of uh, pied ones. Uh, but we do have. Hopefully this time she messed with me. She lied to me last time. We have a probable gravel female who has locked multiple times with two different ivories, one being a banana ivory and the other one being a possible super pastel, possible calico, possible orange dream, possible pinstripe ivory. So both of those have been paired and locked with her in the past. This season, we're only putting the banana to her because I would really like to figure that out. I can deal with um, the other one later uh, because I really want to make the banana highways, which would look really, really cool. Um, and maybe I will, maybe I will interchange them, but they've been locking consistently. So that's why I haven't been rotating out the boys a whole lot. Um, that in this last season has made me really question um, rotating different males in and out with the weird clutches that we got and whatever was going on with some of our babies. It was insane. Uh, but hopefully that's what we have going this coming season. So this year, this coming maybe around mid, uh, mid to late summer, early, uh, fall, we'll have hopefully some clown babies, hopefully some highways, um, and some really pretty, just kind of other little ones as one as my own little pet project, which I've hinted at, um, and a couple other like Instagram posts, but I'm not going to mention right now because I want to see if it will happen. Um, but I know like Brian Barcheck is working on, he was working on a Barney ball python to make it all purple. I'm working on a Minecraft ball python where it all looks kind of pixelated. Uh, so, and I think that'd be really cool. And I don't know if I can do it because some of the genes that I'm working with don't seem to be like a line trait, kind of like with pied breeding high white to high white doesn't always yield that. Um, and with the genes that I'm working with, it doesn't always work like that too. Like the higher white or the more kind of pixelated looking, uh, morphs and patterns don't always hold true with breeding, but we'll see. Um, they said the same thing about paradoxing with boas and I'm starting to see that there might actually be paradoxing in boas. Uh, and this coming fall season, I will, uh, be pairing up our paradox boa to see if that isn't or isn't true. And if not make some really high pink animals either way. So, haha. Um, that being said, uh, oh, right. I mentioned, uh, moving out, uh, the, uh, the banana Mojave. So I have a number of animals in our corn. Sorry. When I, again, apologies, audio listeners, um, behind me, behind this wall off to stage left over here is my quarantine closet where that's the only reptiles in this room. Um, they're kept entirely separate as with quarantine and all that jazz. Um, I have quite a few that will be coming out of quarantine soon. Uh, some will have theirs restarted, but that's okay because they're babies and they need to stay in those smaller locking tubs anyway. Um, so our friends, Nature's Educators, who is a really cool wildlife education group here in Southern Colorado, though they're all over the area. They'll, they've done shows up in Fort Collins, I think. Um, they did a video with us for our Halloween Spooktacular again. Um, and apologies, a little quick drink again. Sorry, I've been essentially repeating the same stories for like four hours now. So a little, getting a little dry. Um, they, they don't have as many shows because of COVID and all that. And while they do take care of the animals that they do bring in, so they are surrendered some animals occasionally, uh, reptiles is what I'm referring to obviously, because Jay-Z's reptiles, um, you know, it's not necessarily their wheelhouse. They really do a lot of the raptors and things like that, which is really, really cool. Um, and hopefully with some of them, I will be doing another really cool animal video. Uh, I, I tried to start it this last year, but between COVID and just how messed up of the latter half of the year, um, you know, outside of the world of Jay-Z's reptiles, notwithstanding, because, yeah, crazy. Um, it's just been nuts here for a lot of different reasons, uh, between my own personal stuff and dealing with some mental issues, uh, some mental health issues and, uh, some animal things and, and, and veterinary bills and other issues and things like that. So just didn't really work out. 
but hopefully we'll be doing some really cool animal videos with them. Uh, I'm going to be touching base again with them because they um, they asked if we wanted some animal ambassadors from them that we could potentially use for our own shows and things like that, which I absolutely do plan to do. We received a couple animals from them. Um, as well as we also got that banana Mojave around the same time. And so they're all going to be leaving quarantine soon and be put into different places. Um, and they'll, although they'll probably be moved around more, I'll probably just put them in rock systems for a little bit. Although some of them will not be staying there, uh, even very long, but it is because, uh, as I said before, they are downsizing. Um, I didn't really ask if it's because it's just not really viable for them to keep right now without them doing a whole lot of shows and things like that, or if they just don't really feel super comfortable with keeping them because like I said, it's not their wheelhouse. Um, boys, sorry. It's the pet rats They're I woke them up. Essentially. They are normally up during the day. Um, like the middle of the day and the middle of the night and they were sleeping, but I woke them up. So sorry about that. Um, and one of the dogs downstairs is not barking because she has heard me. So I do apologize a little bit about that. Um, but they did give us a few animals to use as animal ambassadors, including one which uh, hopefully I will get him to be an ambassador. He's a, a Florida banded water snake, and uh, he has stopped biting me mostly. Ooh. But we're working on that. He's really, really pretty, and I hope he's going to come through. Some of those Florida localities, uh, Nerodia, get really nice high reds and oranges. So hopefully he'll look really pretty as he gets a little bit older, but they are, uh, again, asking if we can take a couple of their ambassador animals. Uh, and I said, yep, let's, let's do this thing. So I need to make a little bit of room in quarantine because, uh, most of them are species I have never kept. They're not difficult species to keep by any means. I just personally haven't kept them before. It's although I certainly know how, most species at this point, you could hand me and I could say, okay, I can get this nailed down very quickly and then uh, really dial in uh, after just a little bit of research or talking to a couple different people. Although I guess that's research too. But so I will hopefully do a video about moving them out so I can actually really highlight the animals that we got, which are really cool animals, including Sir Hiss, the water snake. Uh, just because I think Nerodia are really cool. Not necessarily the most handleable, obviously, uh, animals or even the best pets, but they're still a really beautiful snake species and a couple other really interesting animals. So have those. Um, and then, oh man, uh, talked a little bit longer in this one, but that's okay. Um, I'll kind of wrap this up a little bit. Uh, whew, getting a little tired. So hopefully I'll do a video about that, although it's coming up really soon. So uh, doing this for 4 a.m. Wednesday morning. So I have all day Wednesday. And then today when this video comes out Thursday, uh, to get all of that ready and film, cause I'm also alone right now. Uh, my, uh, better half as far as, uh, in working with the animals and playing crewmate and cameraman are not here right now. So I'm doing all of this by myself, which is not hard, but it takes up a whole lot more time when you're doing everything by yourself. Uh, so hopefully I can get that recorded and I can actually show off these really cool, amazing animals that will be used because, uh, some of them are really, really cool as well as another animal that I'm super excited about, uh, that pit that fits my current, uh, nice, uh, little furry and slip right there. Uh, my current, uh, little obsession as well. And I'll be showing him off too. Uh, so show them off and some new ones coming in that they will be shown off once they clear quarantine as well. Uh, and then I have just one more update and then, uh, I'll kind of wrap this up a bit and it may have been better suited when I was still talking about the boas, uh, but, uh, Pi, our sun glow albino female boa. Um, I say that we actually have a couple different sun glows from different, uh, albino, uh, albino bloodlines like VPI and stuff. Um, but Pi, she is our most handleable snake period. Um, even more than any of the ball pythons or any of the things like that. And I don't know, I can't sit there and say that she enjoys being out because you can't know, but she's very tolerant of it. She's very aimable about everything. And she, it does seem like she does enjoy it or at the very least is very curious or interested in people when she's out. 
Um, and she's really great for working with people who are kind of just getting into snakes. So whenever I do a show or a just talking to people about snakes, I always start with like a, a ball python, like a bell or a highway um, that it doesn't even look like a real snake. And so they go, oh my goodness, what is this? And so, you know, after talking with them for a little bit, you kind of build up their, you know, build up their confidence a bit. You move to a larger ball python. Um, and then if they're okay with like a more fast moving animal, like a snake or like a corn snake or a milk snake. But if not, then I bring out pie who is a smaller boa, but I mean, it's not like she's that small. She's about probably four and a half, five feet long at this point. Um, but she's not, she's not huge by any means. The imperators obviously get much bigger, but we slow grow them. So she may not be a monster period ever. Um, but she is very calm, very slow moving. She is a boa, so she does like to climb over people, but she doesn't wrap up really tightly. So like some of the more terrestrial species like ball pythons and stuff, even when they start to stretch out and get comfortable and move around, they have a tendency to really kind of tighten around. And even king snakes do it too. Um, but they're almost more like a small retic where they just use their whole body to kind of climb instead of kind of anchoring with their tails and then moving around and so she just kind of uses her whole body to very slowly as i kick the camera stand uh to slowly kind of climb and amiably calmly move around and once they are and once people are used to that larger snake she's a really good animal to do it with um and i'm not saying that you can entirely 100 percent trust a reptile um they certainly can be domesticated to a point, but I don't think anything like a dog or a cat. Um, they still do maintain a lot of their, you know, natural wild instincts, uh, which includes opportunistic or defensive striking. But it's never been an issue for Pi, and I do trust her around kids. Maybe not like a toddler or something like that, but you know, for some snakes where like you can, you'll you'll have people will like hold their tails or they'll still hold on to like the bitey end. Pi, I can trust to put on a kid and watch them, obviously, not take my eyes off of them, as long as they're not twisting around and freaking out and, like, and, and booping her nose or something like that. I can trust her to be on really anybody and be okay. Uh, but Pi has... So what happened was I checked on her. She got fed on a Tuesday, checked on Wednesday to make sure that everything was all good, checked for water. And then Thursday, her entire upper jaw and her face, as I cover my mouth, sorry, um, was super swollen. And I went, oh, no, 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 no. So we have a really good reptile vet. She's the one who's taking care of some of our other animals, including Sierra, who did egg bind, and she's doing okay. Um, and hopefully we'll get her on the podcast. But as I said before, it's really hard to get people uh, lined up and scheduled to do this. And even though she said that she's very interested in doing so, um, and it would be really great because there's some, a lot of stuff I'd love to talk about on a podcast with you guys, as far as veterinary goes with, uh, reptiles and exotics. Um, it's just really hard to right now. So, but we got her over there. And so what I think happened was I've been doing small little upgrades and I'll talk and I'll wrap this up with this. I've been doing little upgrades with all of the snakes and I put in a very deep layer of kind of chunkier cocoa husk. Um, to use his substrate and bedding in there with her, as well as um, uh, a few larger pieces of branch um, and some fake plants, even in their tubs. She's in a, she is in a tub setup. It's a very large tub setup. Uh, it's a 74 quart under bed um, storage box. Like it's a little like those split flip tops that you saw in the ball python breeding video that um, just recently came out. So eventually she will be moving to either a Christmas tree tub or an enclosure. And I'm working on that uh, very slowly, but I am working on that. Uh, but she's in one of those. And when you first put that in, anyone who's done that before knows that because you have to rehydrate it, it fogs up with humidity for the first couple days. And what I think happened was, is that I did that and filled up and they're pretty, pretty clear, uh, tubs. And I keep lights on in the room for a 12 hour light cycle. Um, I think what had happened was, at some point she hit the front of it because she saw like a head moving across her path. And so this big warm thing moved across in front of her and she hit the front and it broke a couple of her teeth. 
and uh, and the vet agreed that that's a good possibility because when she opened it up, um, she saw that it was infected. She saw that there were a few broken teeth, and that was a very good possibility. Uh, snakes do lose teeth pretty often, but when breaking them, it can cause issues. And anything to do with the mouth uh, is pretty touchy. You have to be very careful, and you have to handle it pretty rapidly to get you know to get it under control. So we did oral and injectable antibiotics. Uh, and as much as I would like to do a full video about veterinary care and, you know, doing shots with snakes, I don't, because I'm not an expert, and even though I'm comfortable and confident doing shots on a lot of the snakes, I don't really feel really comfortable, like, promoting or putting it out there. Um, not to say that I'm doing anything wrong or immoral or, or, or abusing the animal anyway, I just... I would prefer that people learn from an actual reptile vet or professional than watching, you know, me, Brian, Kevin, and a couple other people give shots. I would rather them learn from an actual professional before they start doing it on their own rather than just watching multiple YouTube videos. Sure, still do that. That's how I, you know, would be more comfortable doing it, but I still wanted to learn from our vet first before I felt comfortable doing that. And so that's why I haven't really done that. Um, and that's honestly, well, here, I'll finish this up with pie. So four week course of those, the swelling went down quite a bit. Uh, a couple more teeth have fallen out um, that were broken as well, but uh, we got her in for a second round. So she's about halfway through that. It's her face is almost back to normal. Uh, she, her tongue is moving out a whole lot better. Uh, she's eaten twice. Uh, she's shed twice and she's starting to act a little bit more like herself and being more curious and stuff, which is great because she is, I don't like the anthropomorphism of my fur babies or things like that, but she really is my little baby. I love her so much. Um, but I haven't really done a video about her or I haven't really talked a whole lot about her either because I don't still, I don't feel super comfortable kind of divulging those things because, um, number one, even though, I mean, I don't have nearly as high level of scrutiny as some of those bigger guys, like I mentioned before, whenever you have a sick snake on camera, even though you're taking good care of them and you're doing everything in your ability, plus other people's ability, even more knowledgeable and experienced than you, there's always so much hate with that, that comes to there. And as much as it is entirely true that that is a whole part of it, and I will talk about it constantly, and I'll have people on to talk about it, um, I just don't, I'm not there comfortable enough yet to be talking about that as well as, like, other things, like loss and 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 animal and baby die-off and things like that. I just don't feel super comfortable uh, expressing it on here, and I'll certainly talk about it, but actually showing it is kind of weird. It's kind of like how I don't like to actually see the animals feed. So I think it's really cool how snakes eat. And I think it's interesting that like their the mechanisms of how they do it, but I don't really like to see it. And especially when I have to feed live, I do have a couple live eaters and I really don't enjoy doing it. I don't like to feed it. I don't like to watch it. And so I, I feel like I have a little bit of a personal thing with that where as much as yes, it is interesting and I can watch and I can watch it and I understand it. I just don't want to include it yet. That may change in the future and it probably will. I'm just not super comfortable with a lot of my own personal stuff. And because I maybe because I love her a little bit more and I am more attached to her closer to like a companion animal than some of my other reptiles, maybe something because of that. I don't really know, but I just haven't really shared it a whole lot. Um, because I just don't feel super comfortable with that. And that's maybe because I'm still a bit of a private person, which you wouldn't really think based on the fact that I have a YouTube channel and I'm exposing all these things and showing off stuff constantly, as well as multiple things. Am I even in my own house and collection? But there's a lot of stuff that I do like to kind of keep, you know, close to the chest because I just, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I'm pretty anxious and I kind of have some trust issues and things like that. So, but you know, we need to work on that a little bit. And so this is kind of one way that I can work on that is to share it with you. Um, and so along those lines, as far as community goes, I think that we are starting to see a small upward trend of a better community in the reptile 
uh, hobby as a whole. Yeah, there's still the infighting, and yeah, there's still everyone that hates on, you know, the really successful people um, based on what they have done or not done, changed and have not changed, whatever may have you. Like I said, I'm not going to get into that part. Um, but they, I do feel like I'm seeing it more. I still, I still have to stay on the Facebook for Facebook groups, uh, because I'm still getting started and I really am doing my best to kind of make a better community because as I've mentioned before, Colorado, the reptile community is not great compared to a lot of other places. Um, a lot of infighting, a lot of hush hush. Nobody really trusts each other unless like you're in. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but I would like to make a better, more inclusive reptile community here, which starts with, you know, sharing your own stuff and being open, being honest, being open for criticism if something is not being done correctly. Um, and while, you know, everyone has their opinions about what the proper thing to do as far as husbandry goes, honestly, I mean, there's obviously, there is a line, obviously, um, but if you are keeping things correctly for your setup, that's what matters. Um, I've been to places where ball pythons are kept on Aspen, but it was Houston, Texas, and humidity is nuts there. So Aspen on the ball pythons is fine. I've seen retics kept on Aspen, and they are shedding and hydrated just fine. Um... I've seen ball pythons kept in open-air screens, and they're doing okay. And I've seen a lot of husbandry things that people go, wait, what? But it works out really well, and the animals are very healthy, and they're being cared for properly. And honestly, their setups kind of make me look like, oh, I should be doing better too. And I would have said that's a no-no or something like that. Um, and so we're starting... And so I kind of went off a little bit of a tangent about that, but... There's seems to be a better idea of good husbandry is what I should say. So for a long time, for the past, like, you know, 15, 20 years, things like reptile carpet and, uh, you know, no UVB on animals that we're starting to see that even though they weren't the best, they were like accepted as a standard. And so we've moved away from some like heat rocks. Everyone knows heat rocks are horrible now even though they're still being sold in pet stores, and even some specialty stores, which is, blows my mind, um, we know that they're not great. And so we're starting to see, like, a change in that. So where infrared UVB bulbs, they're still being used a lot, but they're not using as, not UVB, infrared uh, heat bulbs. They're not being used as often. We're seeing more uh, ceramic and heat panel type heating elements. We're seeing uh, no, not a whole lot of reptile carpet and, and just newspaper we still see it sometimes in like breeding operations but that's a whole other conversation um but just overall like pet husbandry i'm seeing more bioactive i'm seeing more like professional nice criticism or comments and things like that i'm starting to see a little bit more of a trend towards inclusivity um and yeah there's still clubs in there um and i'm not gonna touch a whole lot about that there's still snobbies there's still, and there's levels to that, um, which has gotten me in trouble for saying that people are snobs, uh, but there's reasons behind that, and that's, you know, that what they think is the only way or the best way, or that they're not open to saying that other ways are possible, or that one person's project is as good or as important as theirs too, because it's not like any of them are contributing to conservation or anything like that, but I digress. I just wanted to say that there is kind of a better upswing in the community, or at least I hope there is. I really do. Because like I I mentioned before, I'm kind of late in the game to get into this hobby. Um, had reptiles for close to 10 years now. No, no. Yeah, 10 years. But not really active in the community other than the last like five years. And then even then, really getting my feet wet in the last two years. So kind of late in the game. I'm, I'm 30 at this point. So wouldn't, uh, yeah, a lot of people get started in their teens and their early twenties and things. So I'm kind of late to the game. So after going through a lot of other things that didn't quite fit right, I found this really cool thing and all these other people that are excited, uh, for the same thing I am. And it's kind of the same as a lot of places too, which a lot of infighting, a lot of people that you don't really want to mess with or talk to or would ever be interested in being around, or that's kind of how everything goes. 
Um, and I should be aware of that at this point, but still a little upsetting. So I would like to make the reptile community better. And that does start with being open and honest with yourself. If you're lying about things, uh, if you're showing off, you know, stuff that you know is not great, or you're just being openly hostile towards people that, you know, it's one thing if they say, I don't care, screw you, I'll do what I want. That's one thing versus... You know, just saying uh, what this guy did five years ago is awful and he's the worst and you are the worst. They could have learned from that. Um, they're just getting started and they don't know any better. And so there's a lot of like, you know, the pet, the, the heat rocks and the reptile carpet and things that have been essentially an industry standard, even though we know that they're not the best for it, has been accepted for a long time. And they're starting to change that. I'm not seeing nearly as much reptile carpet. Um, I still see heat rocks, but not nearly as much. And a lot of the things that we thought were bad, but turns out are good, or things that we thought were good that are kind of bad, are starting to change. Um, and so I'm trying to do my best to show that as, you know, good husbandry for without. There's a thing that hasn't been touched on too, too much, and I feel like it is now just starting, um... Sorry, drink really quick. And I promise this will be the last thing. Is that, you know, we should always strive and achieve as a standard good husbandry. Humidity, temps, lighting, all of that should just be met as a standard. And then from there, we go forward into enrichment and choice. And I want to do a whole video about this. And you've and you and if you've watched any of like the enclosure upgrade videos, you see me touch on it a little bit. And enrichment is something that obviously is getting thrown around a whole lot and that more people are really starting to talk about more, but choice is something that isn't quite there. So I've seen it done a couple different ways and I tried to emulate that a little bit. So if you look at one of my enclosures, um, you know, so I have a three foot long enclosure for a smaller Mexican black king snake. A lot of people would say that's a big enclosure for him. What I did was I took this piece of plastic and ran it down as a divider in the substrate and I did one half a loose sand desert arid substrate and the other half a uh, still a more like subtropical drier but um, topsoil eco earth and cypress mulch that could stay a little bit more humid and has a different feel and I ran that in the middle and I put hides on both sides. And I put a water dish in the center and I put trees and climbing branches over all of it. And I let him choose where he wants to be. In the case of O'Malley Mexican, Pink, Mexican Black King Snake, his choice was to rip up the plastic divider and spread a substrate all over and make one solid thing. But for the Great Banded King Snake, Nez Pierce, he spends all day in the smaller it's smaller than the uh mexican black king snake he spends most of his day either under one of the rock shelves and walls that i made or in the cypress mulch uh topsoil mixture and then at night he comes out and he cruises everywhere the fat tails do it the leopard the leopard gecko does it um and even the bearded dragon actually um for a while she was not using it a whole lot but i then cut back the amount of desert substrate that I had, added more topsoil, gave her a big mounded hide, and she hasn't used the hide. She still stays on a lot of her climbing branches because bearded dragons do like to climb and perch, um, even as larger individuals. And so she does that a lot. But then she did start to dig and burrow like bearded dragons like to do. And that can't be achieved with reptile carpet or newspaper or even just um, a thin layer of loose substrate, which loose substrate, there's a whole thing about that, but I'm not going to touch on that. So just something that I think needs to be talked about a little bit more that I'm doing the best that I can with that. Um, I don't have the hundreds and thousands of dollars to make a reptile zoo. No, I'm not hating on anyone who's building a reptile zoo right now. I am super envious of them and I wish them luck on that because that's kind of all of our dream is to have a reptile zoo. And I, I mean, I certainly know I would love to be able to say that my fully financial, like fully financially supported career is breeding snakes to the limited capacity that I do and doing animal education or even having a small little like private facility where I could charge uh, admission for a smaller reptile zoo or something like that. Everyone would love to be able to say that. And I certainly would too. Um, but that all starts somewhere 
And this is hopefully a platform that you all will enjoy that will hopefully get me closer to that. Or at the very least, I get to just share some of my knowledge and passion with you guys. And I'll be learning along the way with you. Uh, sorry, I got a little ranty there at the end. I can't help but do it. Hopefully, I didn't lose any different strands or tangents along the way. Um, thank you so much for enjoying this one. This ended up being a little bit longer than the previous one, but that's okay. I like the hour to hour and a half format anyway. Uh, I'll try not to go this long with just me in the future, but I just kind of rolled with it. I, like I said, I changed it up a little bit after doing the full podcast beforehand and i really hope this goes well this time you guys uh but hopefully you enjoyed it um hopefully you enjoyed the podcast in general if any of you who listen to this number one thank you for the small amount of you who do i really do appreciate it so much it's almost like i'm talking to a wall sometimes it feels like but those of you who do listen and do comment it honestly means the world to me even though i don't show it very well um but if you have anything that you'd like to hear about or know anyone who would want to be on the show, or if you would as well, um, let me know down in the comments. Hit me up at jayzsreptiles at gmail.com, all of that fun stuff. Um, thank you so much again. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode of Keep Calm. It's just a snake podcast. Like I said, uh, Cassandra Bugier will be on that, and it is a really cool podcast. Like I said, not really centered around reptiles, but... I think anyone who is interested in wild animals or just animals in general or kind of concerned about outside of just keeping in captivity, you'd get a lot, you would get a lot from that. And honestly, there's some things in there that I didn't give too, too much thought to that made me go, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. I do apologize about the sound quality for you audio only listeners. Um, like I said, doing my best to improve that, but got to get through the bank that I have. Although that being said, uh, some really amazing guests on the bank that I have, uh, already built up. So if you can tolerate a little bit, not as high quality, uh, maybe for your commute, uh, maybe not, uh, in, your, in, in the, in the car or maybe in your office versus like in your headphones while going for a jog or something, uh, maybe you'll enjoy that. So thank you again so much. Really do appreciate it. Um, uh, I don't have a great signing off phrase, uh, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully, uh, you're having a great day, uh, night, whenever you're listening or watching this and, uh, yeah, thank you so much. TTFN.